yeah, we're, we're putting plants in the ground and all that, but we got to think about the, the real purpose for that is we're farming wine, not, we're not farming grapes. You're listening to the Vint Podcast, bringing you expert interviews, alternative market insights, and exclusive access to the world of wine and spirits investing. Enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Vint Podcast. My name is Brady, and I am without my co-host Billy Galenko today, who is out gallivanting on the other side of the pond, uh, doing some traveling, some wine tasting, some um, sightseeing, and and hopefully eating some good food too. So we'll hear from Billy when he gets back in town, uh, hopefully next episode. Uh, But this is a short intro today. Just wanted to provide a little bit of context around our interview for today. We have Andrew Jones of Field Recordings and Fabulist fame. Um, Field Recordings, the uh, multi-site producer out of the Central Coast. They have a number of wines from top select vineyards uh, around the Central Coast of California. Um, especially Pastor Robles, where they're working on uh, Rhone varieties, uh, doing a lot of really cool things with white wine skin contact. Um, really awesome packaging, uh, really spectacular wines just in terms of the quality of the fruit. And I think a lot of our conversations that we get into with Andrew today uh, kind of center around talking through the blending of the two roles that he's taken on over the last 15 or 16 years with these projects one as kind of vineyard manager, uh, site identifier, and uh, just like uh, viticulturalist, and also kind of this role as winemaker and how those two things play together um, for him in his career. So we talk about winemaking, we talk about vineyard site selection. Uh, Andrew has probably been in almost every vineyard at some point on the Central Coast, and so he has a breadth of knowledge about winemaking in that region. It's one of Billy and I's favorite regions, and it's a place where uh, Billy kind of got an early start uh, working for some wine labels in that area. So we're excited to have Andrew Jones on today, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Hey, Andrew, it's great to have you today. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. We want to, obviously, there's, um, I think, a number of different routes we can go down, and, um, you know, Billy has some roots in the Central Coast. Um, I've got to do some visiting there, and that's kind of unique for me because I live on the East Coast, so, um, you know, a lot of good memories tied to time that I got to spend out there. Um, We'd love to hear how you got your start uh, in wine and sort of, uh, you know, over as your projects have evolved over the last couple of years, you know, sort of where you're at today and, and how that's different from maybe when you started out and what you were expecting. Yeah, I um, I started in this whole deal 20 years ago. Or actually, this is my 21st season working on the vineyard side of things. Um, I started working for a wholesale grapevine nursery with uh, six months left in college at Cal Poly. And that's the, the only real job I've ever had. It's actually... Uh, um, I still do that job to this day. That is that is the day job. I make wine on nice. the side, yeah. uh, technically. Um, and uh, so I've been working for Sunridge Nurseries, one of the, the largest uh, wholesale grapevine nursery. I run the wine grape uh, side of the, the business um, uh, for the company. And uh, uh, so started in that and then started making wine. Uh, I guess I'm 14 years into it. Uh, I think this year will be my 15th harvest. Um, and... Uh, Basically, it was just, I wanted to learn more about the winemaking process. I was, when I was going out and planting these new vineyards and getting getting new vines to people, I was dealing with the winemaker a lot more than the vineyard manager on how we lay it out, how we design it, kind of what goes into it. And um, so I just started making some wine in my spare time during the harvest months when it's really quiet for the nursery. And that sort of rolled into a whole new enterprise for me with, uh, with field recordings. Yeah, I think that's interesting that you mentioned um, that you were working with a winemaker and kind of were like use general terms, which is fine, but I want you to drill down there on like, what does that mean? How things were laid out and um, like, what was the winemaker? What kinds of things were you guys looking at in the vineyard? Maybe like 15 years ago versus, or I guess that was, you know, 10 years ago to now, like what kinds of things are you, were you talking about then that maybe that conversation has changed? Yeah. So the, the main thing was like, uh, 
it's it's not just a vine that we're getting to grow. Like we're we're thinking about how that wine is going to translate to an end wine versus how it's going to translate to an end vine or plant. Like, yeah, we're we're putting plants in the ground and all that, but we got to think about the the real purpose for that is we're farming wine, not we're not farming grapes, um, you know. And so, um, you know that 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 whole saying that coming on with with like you know how we farm wine, uh, you know, it's kind of it's very true on stuff like well how do we want to utilize the the things on these ranches like uh you know north you know uh whether it be like north slope south slope east you know whatever the row orientation might be whether that be the rootstock that we use how does that rootstock going to affect the chemistry of the end wine um and then when you get into the whole uh clone thing you know a lot of the winemakers like to talk about you know this clone that clone and all that um, you know, and how that is going to relate then to um, the end wines and, and trying to get stuff that's going to also, um, I, I feel like I've gotten to the point now where um, not only am I pairing plants for that property, but I know, I, you know, have a good um, knowledge of like what plants will pair well for that winemaker's winemaking style. Mm. Uh, so and trying to kind of get all that stuff aligned is... Uh, it, is the main thing so have you come full circle at all and and work with any of the vineyards that you help plant um in any of your wines yeah so we um i have a few vineyards that take in the whole way taking the whole thing full circle and now produce the wines from those properties um i've also had some stuff with like experimental varieties or things that i want to try that i was able to get grower friends to take a chance on and uh you know, um, prime example is we have the only uh, commercial planting of Shirello on the um, in California right now that I nice. um, got a friend to plant in Santa Barbara County. Um, you know, and, and things like that. So, um, you know, I have a I have a vineyard that I work with in West Paso that they planted a whole selection of heritage Cabernet clones from historical vineyards in Northern California, um, and uh, you know we use that for for one of our wines. Um, and uh you know all, all different kinds of stuff like that so cool i'm kind of a, a sucker for obscure grape varieties can you uh share a couple of the other ones that you may have planted yeah so um uh so recently um well the stuff that i have in production right now would be shirello mm-hmm. um been pushing uh with charbono for central coast um, some of my favorite, like iconic California wines, are from those old Charbono vineyards in Calistoga, mm. and I always relate Calistoga to being very similar to Paso Robles climate-wise, with it being a little bit, you know, the, the warmer part of the Napa Valley, yeah. um, and all that. And uh, so we mess around with that. Um, this year, I will uh, harvest Sauvignon, uh, Trousseau, Pulsard. Um, we got some Trousseau Gris as well that we're going to get going on. Um, also messing with some different grapes that we can use for my skins uh, program, which is our Skin Contact White program for field recordings. It's become a big thing. Um, so I have uh, Petit Mansang, Gros Mansang. Um, what else do I put out there? Um, Falangina. Uh, yeah, nice. yeah. Also just resurrected a little vineyard. Um, there's about 50 vines up in Tepesque Canyon in Santa Maria that were from original cuttings from the La Parisima mission of uh, Mission Pais. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, and so I recently uh, took some cuttings off of that and we put a couple acres of that in Paso to try that out. And uh, I'm really like, one thing I'm kind of after right now is like trying to create some uh, um, lighter table wines. Um, I feel like that's just the category where like the, the consumption trends are going and stuff and like looking to um, looking to work with more grapes, especially like past Robles is thought of as making these big extracted ripe red wines, but we can do a pretty good job too with uh, maintaining acidity here for lighter stuff. Um, and that's sort of the, the, you know, that's where I'm pushing hard is for uh, things that are warm climate grapes but they can be more elegant and finesse refreshing wines yeah and I've, i think i've experienced that like well even in the reds especially like on the west side up in the hills and stuff is that like in terms of where your projects these vineyards are mainly located around the paso 
area? Uh, is a lot of your stuff in the West or kind of how's it laid out? Not to get too into it, but. Yes. Yeah, so I, um, my one main site that I like is an old vineyard that's in the river bottom, essentially in the north central part of town, uh, super sandy soil. Um, so uh, that's, um, that's been one spot that I have, have a bunch of things put in there. Um, we call it the hinterland vineyard. Um, and then uh, I do a lot of stuff over in El Pomar. Um, so mm -hmm. El Pomar, uh, kind of like southeast side, but uh, you have the west side soil. It's the, the heavy chalk rock. But then there's a few more heat units there. And it's, uh, um, in my opinion, it's like the best bang for the buck wine growing area in Paso because you have the right soil. You're getting coastal influence from the Templeton Gap plus Monterey Bay. Um, but like, it's, it's a little bit easier to farm there. You're not using those extreme hillsides that they have on the west side when you get out to Willow Creek. And so for, I think for me, I make bottles of wine that retail for 20 to 40 bucks. And you know, those sites that are on the west side, they're so challenging to farm and so intense that, you know, those have to be going to, you know, north of $50, you know, programs. So I right. really, yeah. I mean, everybody's flagship GSM blend on the west side, I think probably comes in at 75 to 100 these days. So, um, yeah. and you got, you have to be there. Like the quality's there and stuff, but like those vineyards are so hard to farm. Um, you should, when we put a new one in for the nursery, you know, we can get with a full crew, you know, maybe a, a crew member can plant a hundred vines in a day. Whereas, you know, other applications and stuff like East flat ground and stuff like you could have one person knocking out 500 to a thousand plants in a day, you know, on sandier soil on flatter ground and stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's serious bit of culture inputs. That's a great, that's a great kind of insight or like thing to consider that I don't know that we've talked a ton about, or we've heard a lot about from folks when we talk about, you know, deciding which sites they're planting. And it feels like something that only comes from someone who's kind of first foray is viticulture. Uh, cause you went from viticulture to winemaking and obviously others go winemaking to viticulture in terms of like their emphasis or where they spend a lot of their time. What do you think is the best? Like if you could go back, would you rather have been doing more winemaking to start? Or do you think starting in the vineyard is always the best? I think, uh, I think starting the vineyard was good for me on the winemaking side because I never had any formal training in winemaking. Um, you know, I don't have a textbook to go back to on how wine should be made or have a, I've never had any classes on like wine yeah. chemistry and, and all that. And, you know, so everything for me is based on the growing side and then taste and feel rather than, you know, a full chemistry experiment. But the exception to that being sparkling, cause I do a lot of sparkling wine and, uh, um, that truly is a chemistry experiment, uh, experiment, but, uh, um, you know, I think it's been good for me to be able to develop a style for things that I make both on field recording side and on my other wine company, Fabulist, um, you know, that's, that is viticulture driven and then, uh, um, you know, working with what we got in the winery. Nice. So Something you, um, go ahead, Bill. Yeah. Uh, oh no, you build on that. I was going to pivot a little bit. Yeah, so like like one thing for example for me on stuff like, um, you know, I I pick everything off of bricks or sorry off of the acidity rather than bricks. Mm, um, I'm not big on sugar, it. like um, you know, like we need to have natural acidity in it. So that's really the only thing like when it bring in numbers and stuff into it, like because I do feel that once vineyards have started losing their natural acidity that in the winemaking process, you just start chasing your tail on turning that into the wine that it's gonna be like, ultimately that's peak ripeness on the bell curve. And so um, like, I think I, I am drawn to wines more in the end that are picked off of that, that have their proper natural acidity rather than, you know, it's basically dehydrating um, to get to the, the ripeness levels, um, you know, and then you just have to manipulate it on the wine side. So. Um, you know, a, a 13% alcohol wine with the right natural acidity, I tend to go towards instead of a 14 and a half percent alcohol wine that's had acid added to it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I, um, I don't think people like I used to work for, a, a Paso and Monterey 
based winery, at least that's where their estate vineyards where the wineries, they have two wineries. Um, and I don't think people understand how, how cool and cold it can get in Paso at, at night and how that, that natural, I mean, just the cooling effect actually can create these, these wines with nice finesse rather than just giant wines. And I, I think arguably more finesse sometimes than, um, like somewhere like Napa that relies on not only coolness from the water, but like fog. It's, it's more this like really cool air that cools Paso. Yeah, I know that that cool air at night. It's yeah, pretty amazing with the you know. I mean, some parts of the summer it'll be forty degrees that will mm. will cool off and, and all that. And uh, um, you know, and, and it's a reason too that I think Paso has kind of become the hub for Cabernet for California, affordable cab because like we can make we get all the flavor profiles that that the consumer wants out of Cabernet Sauvignon, but without the extreme grippy tannins that require either heavy manipulation or a lot of aging time to get, you know, to get around it. And like, uh, I mean, I always got to give props to some of the, the bigger brands like, you know, J. Lauren, Justin and stuff that they're making affordable Cabernet and, and, uh, and they've, they've paved the, the way for that on, you know, for that, that category and you got, you know, delicious Cabernet that you, everyone can afford that you can, uh, you know, open on any night of the week and, it's super dependable and it's a, it's a classic wine. Yeah, I agree. I feel like there's, it's, um, uh, just, you know, a, a, a prime price point for people to be able to get into some of those other wines in the region as well. Like, you know, they come just say to, I'm just thinking of like Austin Hope, they buy their, you know, 55 or whatever their cab, $55 cab. And then they realize that they make, you know, Syrah and they like, I think they have a single, variety like Mouved bottling um like those kinds of things that you end up getting into once you attach to those brands i mean i think that's that's huge especially because like you said consumers are looking for that profile yeah um, on on the note of ranges yeah i was gonna say let's let's pivot back to your your two wines can you explain what the difference between um field recordings which you you solely own or run and then fabulous which you also are a big part of um, yeah, so um, Fable or sorry, Field Recordings was the original winery um, for me. Uh, it's um, the concept of field recordings and a recording of a natural occurrence. I feel like is a really relevant for um, you know kind of a, a simple way of explaining the whole terroir concept: people, place, and time captured in a bottle. Um, and that's the thing for all the Field Recordings wines. Every wine is tied to a story that involves the people that are farming it, that unique piece of dirt, or those unique grapes that are maybe planted there, and all that. Um, we, with field recordings, deal with more like esoteric stuff. We make a lot of skin contact white. Uh, we do a lot of pet nat, um, but then I still do a little bit of like things like cabernet and all that under it. But um, the thought process is different. Whereas uh, I started Fabulist and. Uh, 10 years ago with my buddy Kurt Shacklin that has uh, San Liege wines and for that we wanted to do classic varietal wines from the central coast of California that over delivered for the price that had great varietal character and that were not overly manipulated you know minimal intervention winemaking um, just like very pure varietal expressions that uh, were at a very affordable price point. So, so like for Fabulist, our main thing is doing Paso Cab. Um, we do Chardonnay from the Edna Valley, which I think is one of the nice. most underrated appellations in California. Mm -hmm. uh, we do Pinot Noir from Santa Barbara. Um, and then uh, we do a Rosé program from Paso Robles as well. Sauvignon Blanc from Santa Barbara. Um, and th those are kind of the, the staples for the Fabulist uh, company. Nice. Yeah, no, that's... After I haven't had the the opportunity to have any fabulous yet, so I'm gonna seek some of those out. I, I like when people try to make the wines taste like the grapes that they come from, rather than a style that they think people want. I think yeah. it just makes a lot more sense. Um, well, we are my partner and I down here. We are big um, skin contact fans in general. We, we drink a lot of those types of styles of wine, so we've we've been kind of watching the field recordings journey, and I think it's kind of cool because it looks like you guys have really gained a lot of momentum. Um, I remember when, you know, we used to find it in our natural wine shops and now it's at Whole Foods. It's, it's all over the place. 
Yeah, it's been, uh, I, I got enamored with those wines when I started traveling for field recordings early on. So when field recording started, it was a few single vineyard wines, and then I made this catch-all red blend called Fiction. Um, I had a very Central Coast palette, I, I feel like, or, or just like, you know, I hadn't expanded too much on what I like to do and, and, and or make and all that. And, but, you know, hit the road to share my wines that I made and tell my stories. And, uh, you know, I got introduced to orange wines and, and uh, um, then I kind of came in and was like, I think I can make a really good uh, version of that from Paso Robles. That's something that wasn't being done in Paso at the time. Um, came back, I started experimenting for a couple of years on different vineyards and lots that I could work with uh, for that. And um, I think I'm six years into skins and it like grows exponentially on how much we make every year. And um, yeah, it's like, it's like one of those goofy baseball stats on everything, you know, with like, I think we make more orange wine than anybody else in the country. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like the, the leader in seventh inning doubles next uh, against left-handers named Fernando kind of thing. But uh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's been fun. And that's like one of those things where like more new grapes and everything, like the more vineyards I can introduce to that program, the more varieties that we can add to it, the more complexity that I'm building into those. And you know, that like every year we're making a better version of skins, like scaling that up hasn't been to detriment of that program. That wine's only getting better because I can add more components to it. Um, you know, every year. So nice. That was going to be one of my questions. How do you maintain quality while you scale? But I guess you just answered it. It's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, with the extra vineyards and, and different grapes that we can put into it, like, um, you know, so it's always Chenin Blanc and Pinot Gris as the two core varieties, but there's always a little Riesling in there. There's always some Albarino in there. There's always some Verdello in there. Um, this last year we, uh, we introduced uh, Tokai Forlano to it. Um, I have all those new grapes coming online next year. Um, we're also getting some Semillon next year for the first time. I've been experimenting with Malone. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, like it, it, the, really like the, the possibilities are endless. So um, on it. So but, nice. Uh, well, um, yeah, skin, and that's skin like roll into a wines too. Like we do a straight Romato now that uh, we have. A couple of Pinot Gris vineyards that really shine through, and that's the variety that I feel like is the best that, for a standalone. Um, the other ones I feel like are more blending components on it, um, and so we do the Domo Arigato, uh, Mr. Romato, uh, <laughs> as a field recordings wine, and then uh, Skins, um, and then we also do a bag and box orange wine too called Boxy, that um, is uh, we take some of the funky orange lots and we uh combine that with some chardonnay uh and uh it makes a great like skin contact option in that bag and box category um and uh um, that's been a, a, a nice new addition to the lineup as well yeah the, the the skins label was the first um skin contact white that i shared with like a group of people that i knew had never had something like that before um, super accessible, yeah. which I think is probably why it's, it's growing so much in that category. And I also felt like if I'm remembering back, we had a good conversation about like tannin and white wines with that label. Am I off base there or? The, um, uh, no, no, that's, um, that, that sounds correct uh, on it. Uh, the last little bit kind of got cut off there on, on the, uh, uh, about the tannin, uh, on it but uh, yeah i just i i just remember i think we're having a conversation about like i feel like you know just like uh, a lot of people don't have context for there being like tannin structure in white wines and i felt like if i'm remembering back correctly there was definitely some of that in that label do you feel like you get that as well or am i off base um no de definitely like the the key to making good skin contact whites is managing the tannins on it um that's why like every every lot that goes into that has a minimum of 30 days of skin contact um like we push it actually to try to get to 60 days typically oh wow on a lot of stuff uh, it really needs a lot of extended maceration um to really mellow that out and then and then on top of that we age it and we always have a um a percentage of new acacia barrels there 
because we need some fresher barrels to help round it out even more too. But then we want acacia so it's not imparting any vanilla uh, into the wine. Um, so it keeps that like tropical stone fruit, apricot sort of character that, that or orange wines typically have. Um, and uh, But yeah, that's the whole secret in, in my opinion to making good skin contact wines is you gotta be really good at managing the tannin. Uh, you know, the day, if we press it too early, we'll never get a rep past that astringency. Um, like we need to get that stuff to a point where we feel like it's like oxidized and falling apart in the bin. Then we press it and it's perfect. So, um, yeah. that, that's a big thing for us. Like we don't even yeah. like to, uh, when it gets into the extended maceration part of it, we don't even taste it daily to see if it's ready to press. Like I only taste it on a bi-weekly or a weekly basis because I don't want to jump the gun and be accidentally like come in one day and my palate be a little off and then like, oh, it's ready now. It's not going to change in a day. If, if it wasn't ready to press on Monday, it's not going to be ready on Tuesday. You know, it needs, it needs time. I need to let it go. I need to push it on that. Yeah, I feel like I didn't have too much context for like 60 days sounds like a really long time to me. Uh, it wasn't even in my purview of how long I, I felt like that process would go. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's really cool to hear. Um, Billy, do you have anything there? I was going to pivot. I wanted to hear some about the packaging, um, but do you have anything there on the orange wines? No, I, uh, I guess a little bit. I was just thinking about the, the maceration time as well. Um, it's interesting when you – sometimes when you think of extended – even like in a red wine context, some people are leaving it on for a little bit more tannin extraction. Um, as well as like, if you think of like Georgian styles of, of orange wines, some of those can be immensely tannic and those sit with, you know, in their tannin, in the, with their skins and the cuvee for forever. Um, so I, I just thought that was interesting. Also, I don't think people understand, there's a lot of people out there trying to make orange wine and just like, you know, do a little bit of skin maceration not really put much thought and care into their wine and just throw it in the bottle because it looks pretty. I think it's really cool to hear how much time and effort um, go into something, even like skins, which people may see at the grocery store um, as well. So I think that's really interesting. I think we a lot of us, a lot of people fall into that trap kind of on stuff. I related a lot to like sour beer and like sour beer was so hot for a while, but just because mm -hmm. it was sour doesn't mean it's good. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and like just because it's skin contact or it's orange wine doesn't mean that has been properly done or um, just even on like all things with things that fall into the natural wine space on, on stuff just because it checks some boxes like you know that people assume that it's going to be widely accepted and you know like still got to have some TLC there yeah for sure I love that all right Brady ask away on your packaging there <laughs> yeah I feel like we could we could definitely go longer on I always like hearing different folks perspective on the natural wine stuff um, but Let's, I wanted to touch on the bag and box, um, and also we can talk about cans. Um, I know you don't, you don't have your um, alloy can wine project anymore, um, but maybe you can talk about how what that was like starting to explore some of those alternatives. Was that something you've been thinking about for a long time? Like how far back does that go? Um, and what do you think the forward-looking maybe trajectory is for those packaging types being more and more widely used? Yeah, I think the alternative packaging is good for wine overall. And I, I look at that as from my nursery stuff and, and, and seeing the, the, the greater good for the California grape grower or Oregon grape grower, Washington grape grower, or anything like alternative packaging is a good thing because the more we can get the you know general population to accept wine as their, you know, daily pop of choice versus, uh, you know, spirits or, uh, or beer or something like that's good for wine overall. Like we need to make wine more accessible. Wine doesn't have to be ceremonial. Um, you know, and like where we're at now versus 15 years ago, it's like, it's grown exponentially on that, but like, we need to keep pushing it. We need to keep making wine more accessible, not become a luxury good. Um, and all that, like, I mean, I love fine wine. Like there is, uh, like Burgundy, for example, is the perfect example of why wine is a superior alcoholic beverage choice to spirits or beer or anything. It's the only thing that is truly tied to agriculture. You know, the next closest thing would be tequila. That's like literally the only thing that can even sniff uh, wine on like 
you know, how specialized all this stuff is and how uh, the nuance of it that the right side of the driveway tastes different than the left side of the driveway uh, going into a property and, and things like that. Um, and so all that though, I think goes back and relates to, to alternative packaging. Like, can we have really delicious can wine that people can, you know, have as a, you know, RTD or whatever from their, uh, you know, local retailer and just, you know, head to whatever casual event they're doing and, and pop a can of wine. Um, you know, all things like that bag and box too. Like, you know, like having something that is, makes it super affordable for people. You're not committing to having a whole bottle in a night. Yeah, it is, you know, typically three liters of wine at once, but you got three liters of wine that you can keep in your fridge that, you know, you can have a glass here and there over 60 to 90 days. And that thing's gonna be fresh and and just the, the, the last glass is gonna give you the same experience as the first glass. Um, the technology on Bag and Box has gotten way better. That was one thing I looked in Bag and Box years ago and just the bladders are so much better than what they used to be. Um, mm. and the shelf lives that you have. That was one thing why I went cans first before Bag and Box because cans have a great shelf life too. I mean, basically the only reason that there's a date on any cans is because none of the manufacturers of aluminum cans give you any warranty. I have 2012 Vintage Fiction Red cans that I saved that are I can pop and taste great. That was our first venture into can wine. We did it in uh, early 2013. Um, and, uh, you know, like... We were winging it. I had nobody to talk to. I had no idea. I got a mobile beer canning line where I was willing to drive up to Paso from Pasadena and can some wine for me. Like we didn't know how to keep the cans firm. We didn't have, we didn't have squat. Uh, had to figure out everything. Like it ended up, that was actually another thing, like the lower input, minimal intervention winemaking style that we have here actually did us a favor on cans because we're not adding these other products that react with the can or the aluminum the, the the spray liners and things like that like um you know we made some mistakes along the way we got really fortunate in some things and then all that but uh yeah so overall though alternative package i think is great need more of it um the one thing i think we'll see probably swing back in a few years like you know i got out of the can wine uh, spot with alloy because I felt like at that time everybody was kind of chasing it and it was sort of a, a race to the bottom on just getting cans or wine in cans and trying to get it at the same prices that people buy beer cans at and all that and it just wasn't a, a space for me um, and all that but I think you're going to start seeing it swing back where you're seeing more premium stuff going into cans there are premium canned wines out there um, but then at the same time though like I still get calls regularly from some marketing executive that thinks they have the greatest idea for the next great can wine. Um, you know, and, but the first question out of their mouth is how cheap can you get wine in it? You know, yeah. That's not the right approach, but, uh, right. but yeah, I think we'll see it swing back on that. That you'll see higher end wine in cans. There are some good can wines out there. Um, you know, and, and all that. And then also on the bag and box, it's great. Like, you know, we're doing the bag and box. We got, you know, Tablas is doing uh, the their uh, Patien and stuff in bag and box. Got another producer here in Tin City that does like a, a whole like on-prem collaboration lineup of wines called Hubba. It's, the winery is called Hubba, but uh, Riley Hubbard is doing like basically like joint ventures with different wineries to do stuff that like she basically does it on tap via bag and box at her tasting room. It's awesome place to hang out in Tin City. Um, you know, I think you're going to start just keep seeing more stuff like that. Like we're working on a chillable red in, in bag and box right now that hoping to have out towards the end of the year. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're going to keep pushing. So. Did you say 2012 on that fiction can that you yeah, had? Tw 2012 fiction red was the first can. Wow. We did. So, so what, I mean, I hesitate to even kind of broach this, but I mean, you're talking about shelf life. What? what does that mean in terms of just like ageability, like nothing, right? Or what's, can, can you talk about that for some of these alternative packaging? Yeah. Well, that's like kind of the whole thing with like the farce of the, I mean, we do most of our stuff under cork, but like some of the misconceptions on cork and all that, like, you know, like ultimately a wine breathing, it's oxidizing. So like you technically want that like nice airtight seal it's not getting any light on it um, and, uh, and things like that. And so it, it's actually a good vessel for storage 
of of product, um, you know, and and uh, um, the um, yeah, the wine it, it holds up really. So this is another thing too. When I got going on it with Fiction, so Fiction was our main red table wine that we did. It was our most widely distributed wine, and all that. And so um, the second vintage, the thirteen. Um, that was also when keg wine was getting popular for on-premise uh, use. And so I was kegging, canning, and bottling all at the same time with the 2013 Fiction Red. So uh, like the most time that could have elapsed between those wines was about 48 hours, you know, yeah. a, a variable in the tank. But it was all blended up in the same tank, you know, and I'm running kegging. I have a kegging line running off of it. I have a canning line running off of it and we're bottling all at the same time at the same at, at one facility off of the same tank. And it was great to go through that exercise and pour those wines for people because it was like do a blind tasting for people with can versus bottle versus keg. Um and you know and you want to know the only thing that was for sure on that 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 like statistically relevant, the the one thing that mm -hmm. came out of that study is there was one item that always lost. And that was the keg. Yeah. Uh, really? Yeah. So, and I, and like, I get it on keg wines becoming so popular and all that. Um, you know, it, it's a, um, it's a very convenient thing for restaurants and it's good economics for restaurants to just have a tap line and all that. But just for some reason with the way that wine gets pumped and run through those hoses and all that, like, it's just, uh, it was like unanimous always like it was about 50 50 where people would pick the can versus the bottle on all that like it was very neutral but the one thing though is keg always came last hmm. so, do you think it's like the the pressure oh. or is it running through the lines or what do you think, I think what is your theory the, the, with the hoses and uh um and it's one of those things too like beer distributors are all set up with keg technicians on staff that constantly go around and are servicing accounts. None of the wine distributors have that set up in their infrastructure yet. So part of it, I think it comes down to the kegerator used and all that, and like kind of how it's maintained and all that. Um, and, uh, um, but there is something with like that poly, you know, rubber hose that, you know, whether it's a, a small kegerator or a place with like fixed beer lines in that I think the, the, the wine gets kind of, I, I don't know. It just, uh, it's always flat, <laughs> uh, to me on, on stuff. So, uh, hmm. and that's a, that's a thing too. Like the smaller, those places that do smaller kegerator setups, I think do better with it. Um, early on we were doing some keg wines for some beer places that, yeah, they didn't want to keep a wine list. They just wanted to have red and white on draft. And then they had their 50 other tap selections, you know, and they'd have these, you know, hundred foot long uh, hoses going back to the keg room that they were pulling out of. And you could see a big difference on that as we would have, like, I would go in there and, and then have them pull eight glasses all at once, you know, and that first glass would taste way different than the last glass because that wine is sitting in those hoses. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, um, but then at the same time though, like keg wine's back. I got people all over me wanting kegs since, since restaurants are back. And um, we've had, you know, I have to figure out a way to embrace it and do the best job we can to have good wine and keg. So is sparkling a better the keg, it's gonna taste as good. <laughs> yeah. Is the sparkling a better uh, option for keg? Um, Sparkling is tough in kegs because that goes also back to the keg technicians and you have to have really special setups to deal with the pressure in sparkling wine versus beer. Um, like, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you know, McKellar beer, that the Denmark, uh, company that had these beer bars all over the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and they had these special setups and all those, those bars that it was a, it was its own CO2 regulator for every keg. Nothing was on a shared regulator. Like you have to have one of those setups, I think, to properly do sparkling wine, because um, you can't just run it on a like your general kegerator that's a four tap, uh, you know, island uh, uh, tap system. That's only got one regulator in it that is running all four kegs, and it's 
it's a different story on, on how you have to do your settings and all that. So fast, fascinating thing for all uh, folks in micromatic school. I, I highly recommend it for anybody working in rest restaurants. So are you, are you exploring any other alternatives or, I mean, I know we've talked about several of them now and I, I can't off the top of my head think of what else is out there, but is there anything else that you're exploring? Nothing else alternative wise. Um, I do really like the, the one liter bottle, but one liter bottles just aren't feasible in the U S you have to use mm. European glass for that. And European glass, by the time it gets to California, it, it takes away any savings we might have. And I don't think it's worth a premium to do it in one liters versus seven fifties. But I like those one liters. I think it's just more efficient on shipping. Like you got a 12 liter case that's taking up the same footprint as a nine liter case. Um, you know, one liter, I feel like is a pretty reasonable, like shareable size for a, you know, two couples at a dinner, um, and all that without having to get the second bottle. Um, you know, so I, I like stuff like that. It's not really an alternative, but I think some of these sure. size changes are, are, are things, uh, um, that are viable. Um, but, uh, yeah, nothing else really alternative packaging wise for us. Um, yeah. I always thought it'd be fun to do Capri Sun packets, but, uh, nice. uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we have other alternatives that are just as convenient with being able to do cans. So those plastic rip off with your teeth, uh, sugar drink ones. That'd be cool too. What are they called? I like the Kool-Aid ones. Kool-Aid. Yeah, yeah. Or the barrels. That would actually be sweet. The, um, the little barrel pull offs. That would be like, <laughs> that would be a great packaging for RTDs. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so are you, in the last, like, I guess last packaging question, we don't have to stay too long, is uh, are you exploring any other closures at all as well? Or are you just keeping like regular, is it like composite cork? Or are you looking at pop tops? I, I, um, I'm a big fan. We use DM corks on everything. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. that, like, I relate that a lot to my nursery life. Like I'm, I'm manufacturing a biological product that people expect you to have like a, you know, a factory warranty on. Uh, but it's a plant and everything. And you know, that DM has come up with the technology to have a, like to give you a warranty that that cork is going to be TCA free for a certain amount of years. Um, you know, cause like they sell them, <clears throat> you know, three, fives, tens, and I think twenties that they mm -hmm. have. And like, um, and I've looked at the, there's other competitors in the cork space that have a similar product, but they don't give you the same warranty. Um, you know, and, and things like that. And I, I, I drink the Kool-Aid on, on, uh, on that product. So, um, and, and it's just one of those things too, like, again, when I'm talking about all this alternative packaging and all that stuff, like there is a comfort level to a cork and there's like certain things that people still perceive for like a quality thing. And it's also some for the consumers that are into my brand and like buying our wine, like they prefer a cork over a screw cap, you know? Um, I kind of joke around uh, clear glass cork finish can't lose um, is uh, uh, <laughs> with, with the way that the current consumer these kind of or the especially the younger consumers like they want to be able to see the color of it they, you know it's like it kind of goes back to when the rosé boom was happening um, so many uh, uh, decisions are made by like what color the product is and all that but then that's also a thing like everybody always asks me like when are you going to put skins in clear glass I'm like, I'm holding off on that. I'm like, stick with the green glass because I also see like a product like that as the gateway into that category. And we need to have some stuff that's like a little bit more comfortable for people and, and not seeing that amber color right away. Um, you know, because like it's still a catch term. They read about it in a magazine or saw something, you know, on it. Like, oh, what's this orange wine thing? We need to try this. Like, <laughs> oh, that, yeah. you know, so... Yeah. Also, I think the the label on the skins just pops on the green. I don't think it would pop the same with if it was clear. Yeah, I, I think it, and and so much of the decisions on our packaging goes down to like the shelf aesthetic. Like we got to make sure it looks good on the shelf for somebody to take a chance on this unknown brand from a still unknown wine area, uh, and uh, and then we got to make sure it tastes good so they come back and buy it again. Yeah, I wanted to pivot. I guess we've so we've done 
closures, a little bit of viticulture stuff. We touched briefly on sustainability. Um, just wanted to hear what, what are your kind of top, like top two, three considerations when you're out there and you're thinking like, how do we, how do we take a new plot and try and turn it around? Maybe there's been other practices going on. Um, what are your kind of top three priorities when you get somewhere new and you're focusing on, you know, sustainability and trying to create an ecosystem around those new vines? Yeah, I mean, a uh, big thing for me is uh, personality of the grower. Um, you know, uh, I like owner operators. You know, m majority of the vineyards in California now are owned by institutional funds. Uh, mm. um, you know, and things like that. Like it's, but there still is the the local you know local folks that I can I can buy grapes from and all that. I, I do like you know family run type spots um, and all that. Uh, um, you know, and, and then grape growers that like, there's some grape growers that are a little more wine savvy than others, you know, like that, like I'm not making your mainstream wines and, you know, like for some growers have a tough time wrapping their head around what I'm making out of it. And it, it's, uh, um, so that's, that's one of the things to look for. Um, I, I look a lot for, I, I'm more concerned about variety and rootstock than clones. I don't, even though it's like, I, I kind of joke that oh, clones were just a, a thing that uh, helped elevate the uh, nursery, uh, uh, you know, growth because uh, we needed mm -hmm. all these different things, and people had to plant all these different things so they could get all the clones. But uh, I'm really big on rootstock. I think root, rootstock gets discounted a lot. Um, you know, like if you go out to a vineyard that, um, you know, say the vineyard it's a, a uniform block, all the same and you were to plant that block and split it up into four sections where you did the same rootstock and four clones, or you did that same block with one clone and four rootstocks, you'll have drastically different wines for each sub block on the rootstock than the clones. I don't know if that would explain that properly, but like yeah. all these rootstocks forage for nutrients differently, which then leads to different chemistry of the grapes. So like, you know, three of our most popular rootstocks, um, you know, and sometimes you have to use these certain rootstocks, but like, you know, that same Cabernet, you know, on rootstock A will harvest at 3.4 pH, the next one will be 3.6 pH, the next one will be 3.8 pH. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just the thing for like, how much potassium does it pull up uh, when those roots are down in the dirt working um, and, and, and all that. And, and that's like picked on the same day. Kind of thing uh, and it's uh um i think we need to look into that a little bit more but then at the same time though we're also dealing with crazier growing conditions with different changes in the growing environment um you know you got to be able to have stuff that holds up well with heat you know we're getting more extreme cold and more extreme heat uh and, and things like that and you got to be ready for that uh and all that stuff and um but yeah rootstock is a big thing for me um the person farming it is a big thing for me and then, um, and that's, that's really it. It has to be something that I'm excited about. I don't, uh, um, like I, you know, even for stuff when I'm making just a classic varietal wine, like there's just sort of this, like, um, I don't know, there's like a non tangible thing when you go out onto the property and it just feels right. And I don't know, like, I, don't know, I feel like it sounds kind of dumb in saying that, but like, you know, it's, it, it I, I really like, I don't know if anybody saw that, like the 60 minute interview of, of Rick Rubin recently. Uh, and uh, so he's like, you know, do you know how to work a soundboard? No. Do you know how to play an instrument? No. Do you know how to read music? No. But then how does this work? Well, it's like, I just like have this feeling and my, his gut instinct has always never let him down. And so like, I have a similar thing with going on on these properties that there's like a gut instinct that this works or this mm. doesn't work. And, yeah. I, you know, like it, it's, it, you know, there, there is, there's a feeling for each of those vineyards that the, the formula is right there. So nice. Uh, taking, taking one little step back for the listeners. Can you explain one, um, like how the rootstocks are put on to the roots? I, I think it's a really interesting process and I don't think many folks know. And then just like a couple of the high level things that like rootstocks can help solve. Like, you know, they can have be drought resistant, pest resistant, a couple of those high level things. Yeah. So, um, 
So for the nursery, we're farming grapes just the same way as a regular grape farmer would be farming, except we cut all the fruit off. We farm for the wood. So our, um, our crop every year are those cuttings that come off of it in the wintertime when we're pruning. Um, and so uh, we farm a few thousand acres of that. Uh, rootstock makes up, it's usually two thirds rootstock to one third of the scion wood. So scion wood being you know, all the varieties and clones and all that. Um, the uh, um, the rootstock gets harvested typically in like 14 to 18 inch sections um, and then uh, bundled up, brought to the nursery, kept in cold storage until it's ready to propagate. And then uh, we'll also harvest the scion wood in that same sort of length, but then basically every bud on that cutting is a new plant. So then it gets cut up into one to two inch pieces um, and then uh, there's many different ways that you can bench graft vines. There's these Omega cutting machines that, you know, looks like a classic Omega shaped and it's like a puzzle piece. The things just slide together. Um, we use a spline graft that's a little bit more of a straighter cut and it gets a little deeper. Um, there's all different ways that you can do it. It's a fascinating thing, uh, something to YouTube or look up on YouTube or, or, or Google about, you know, plant grafting and then all the different ways to, to do it. Basically, like we take those two parts, we put them in a climate controlled room, um, and that climate controlled room is perfect for getting the callus to grow. So, think of callus as being like you cut your arm and then you get a scab. Um, that is our, our skin tissue healing, um, and the callus is essentially that plant scab, and that holds those two pieces together. And then we take those healed sticks and we'll put them in a greenhouse or we'll put them out in the field depending on what, what type of uh, product that the, the grower is wanting. Um, the rootstocks though, uh, the main drivers for the rootstock are um, lime tolerance is one. So like we have specific things for past robles because we have that calcareous soil, um, how much lime is in the soil, um, that, that's a big thing in it. Drought tolerance, like how deeply rooted are they? Like does it handle water stress really well? There's some rootstocks that have very fibrous roots. Um, and then uh, there's other rootstocks that have mostly tap roots that drive really deep. Um, they're a little bit slower to get going, but they can hold on forever um, uh, kind of thing. Um, so, you know, how the root, the root orientation and the root structure, that's a big thing which relates to the drought tolerance. Um, other things, uh, salt tolerance. Um, you know, with all this irrigated ground, uh, you know, we're building up more salts and, and all that. And, and so how well does the stuff handle salts? Um, other things like the uh, soil pests, like uh, nematodes that, uh, that feast on those roots and can hamper the vines. Um, so if you have nematodes present in your soil, we'll use certain rootstocks over others. Um, but yeah, it's basically chemistry of the soil, like water availability. Um, and then the pests in the soil. And that, those are kind of the main things that, uh, that, that we use to, to break it down. And uh, I mean, we have some stuff, one of the most fascinating areas to put new vineyards in is in the California Delta in Clarksburg. Um, like growers there were actually paying to pump the water out of the vineyard instead of pumping water mm -hmm. to irrigate it. Um, the water tables will be at like under 10 feet. And uh, basically those, those vines are growing in, in, in the riverbed their whole life and um wow. you know you have to have stuff that's very shallow rooted that um can be saturated for longer periods of time and not get uh uh not get uh, goofy looking um so um you know to, so yeah there's all different things that go into it but yeah rootstock is one of the things that i think it's uh that gets discounted a little bit and i think it could be used a little bit more as a wine making tool so um we have about 30 rootstocks ish that get used in California or in the U S on an annual basis. But you know, four of those make up 80% of it. Um, and we gotta be careful on that for monocultures and things like that. And you know, right now we're using stuff that's all resistant and holding up to phylloxera and still and everything. But like, you know, who knows, like if something else comes along and, uh, you know, like when the, the old, there was an old rootstock AXR that failed, in California that, uh, um, you know, the, in, in ag, you know, at some point, you know, it's not if, it's just when. So, 
something will come along. Yeah, that, that's good. I don't think we went that deep in, um, yeah, into that before. I think it's interesting to think about root stocks as you know a lever that you can pull, or that you know a winemaker or a viticulturist should be pulling more often. I think that's cool. Uh -huh. um, yeah, what just uh, I guess to wrap up here, we're almost at time. Um, kind of a little off topic from wh where we've been. Are you? Do you have like a collector's sensibility? Do you collect anything art? Uh, I know you have 2012 fiction. Uh, are you like, uh, what kind of guy are you in terms of what's cluttering up your house? Yeah, the, um, uh, so the one thing kind of randomly, that the thing that I end up buying the most and collect the most that, uh, um, you know, I make all this weird stuff, but to me, the thing that my go-to thing is, is, is actually shard. Um, I like shard that has some age on it. I like all the different styles. Nice. It's the most fascinating of wines to me uh, and the whole gamut of, you know, from, you know, Chablis to Kongsgard, you know, stylistically um, and stuff. And like, uh, for me, there's no better fine wine experience than fancy Chardonnay. Uh, you know, that, it's, that's the thing that just resonates for me personally, uh, my wife as well. Um, so like, yeah, if, if for my personal collection and stuff, uh, um, yeah, shoot, I bet I have, uh, you know, 40 to 50% of that is, uh, um, is shard. Uh, and then a uh, um, client of mine actually from the nursery that I've always just been really enamored with his wines. They're so unique. And uh, I'm a big fan of Cayuse out of Walla Walla. Um, so I, uh, um, I've bought those since I first started working with them, you know, 20, oh, you know almost 20 years ago. Uh, nice. And uh, like, there's something like, you know, that's one of those producers, um, or actually just Grenache and Syrah from the rocks in Walla Walla, I think is one of the most distinct flavor profiles of anything made in the U.S. Um, and I just, I, those kind of resonate with me. So, um, but yeah, if you go look at my cellar, um, Fancy Chardonnay and uh, Cayuse would probably be the two main things that, that nice. I buy um, and, and keep going. Uh, you know, other stuff, I'll get into fads like, was kind of a never like well I got into working with some of those Jura grapes um, you know I got a good little bit of that kind of stashed um, you know and, and some other obscure stuff uh, some uh, Piedmont reds and, and stuff that have been you know they're, they're more like I've gotten them just for winemaking fascination and and, and all that mm -hmm. than than just regular collecting and enjoying so. But, do you, uh, do you know or or hang out with Dave at Monochrome much? Um, I don't I don't know him much other than him being a neighbor and stuff, and we've just had the yeah. neighborhood functions and all that. Um, but uh, but yeah, I was, no, no of Dave. I was going to mention is like yeah, he's like bottling you know Chardonnay with Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Gris like all together. Um, it's kind of crazy. Some of this, uh, like was crazy to me, at least <laughs> some of the blends he was doing, but it was really cool. I enjoy hearing him talk about his stuff. Yeah. All white. Oh yeah. All but, the, uh, um, and, and that's another thing too, for me in general, like just, uh, I know overall, I think my, you know, I bet I'm two thirds of my cellar are white wines. So, mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm drawn to more. And I like older white wines. That's the other thing too. Like, um, I, kind of this, I, I feel like we drink red wines too late and whites too early. Uh, yeah. you know, always it's it almost like that temperature thing with like drinking our reds too warm and our whites too cold. So yeah, that, that's for sure. That's, that's definitely been true for me <laughs> in the past yeah. with the wines that I keep. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. This is great. Thank you. Uh, you gave us a, a ton of insight on some topics we just really don't go deep on a lot. So, yeah, definitely appreciate you coming on, joining us, and um, and sharing about your projects. No, sounds good. Good, good talking to you guys. And, uh, um, yeah, hopefully it was some good info for everyone. So. Yep. Thanks awesome. a lot, man. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. All right, that's our episode with Andrew Jones of Fabulist and Field Recordings. Thank you all for tuning in. Please check out Andrew's projects and ask about his wines at your local wine shop or wine retailer. And we will see you all next week. Cheers.
To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vint platform, find us at www.vint.co. That's www.vint.co. For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vint podcast, please email us at support at vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circulars amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vint platform are speculative and involve substantial risks to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Information provided in any communications, including this podcast, is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering.